Hello and welcome to today's webinar on addressing inclusive recruitment. So I'm just going to go through a bit of housekeeping before we start. So this is an interactive session and we are keen to hear your thoughts throughout. If you would like to ask a question or leave a comment, click on the questions in the control panel and type in your question and press send. There will be a couple of poll questions. Uh, these will appear automatically on your screen. You'll be given around 30 seconds to answer. During our discussion, if you would like to share your thoughts, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand and we will unmute your mic. If you would rather not speak, you can type in the question tab also. Your feedback is extremely valuable, so we will take all questions and comments on board, even if we don't have time to answer them all. Um, so a bit about uh, Dive In. So through the Dive In Training and Development Programme, we want to give businesses the tools and skills they need, whatever stage they're at, to establish or enhance their diversity and inclusion offering to staff. The 12-month programme has been developed in partnership with Kuwait Scotland, um, and with SMEs accounting for around 95% of Scotland's construction industry, the programme has been specifically tailored to provide them with the advice and guidance to implement real change. While COVID-19 has shifted priorities towards industry recovery, the Dive In programme will support and encourage businesses to promote diversity and inclusion, ensuring that it remains an important topic of 2021 against the backdrop of Brexit and the challenges of lockdowns. We have Aileen here today who is going to take our session. So Aileen works for uh, Equate Scotland, Scotland's national expert organisation in gender equality in science, technology, engineering and the built environment. Aileen supports employers recruit and retain women into their organisation. She joined Equate in 2018 to establish Equate Career Hub, a job board designed for employers to find qualified women in STEM. Passionate about moving the dial on gender equality in construction, Aileen has worked on several projects in the sector, working with CSIC, Sir Robert McAlpine and the Scottish Building Federation. So I'll now pass you over to Aileen. Just going to show my screen. Are you able to see that presentation? Yeah, all good. All good. Okay, so hello everyone um, and welcome to today's webinar on inclusive recruitment practice. Um, thank you so much, uh, Kirsty, for that introduction. So last week we had a webinar that focused on the landscape of women in construction and we looked at creating inclusive workplace cultures. So we demonstrated how the principles of health and safety culture that is a really strong part of the construction industry can be applied to creating a culture of diversity and inclusion. But this week we're going to look at how you can make sure your recruitment practice is as inclusive as possible in order for you to attract the best talent from the widest possible pool possible. So while our focus today is going to be on attracting more women into the construction sector, the principles can be applied to attracting any underrepresented group into your organisation. So I'm just going to go through today's session. Firstly, we're going to take a look at positive action. Um, these are steps you can take to encourage participation from underrepresented groups such as women. Um, we're going to look at the common concerns of positive action, a few case studies where it's been really effective and where the line lies between positive action and positive discrimination. We are then going to look at your job adverts um, and what you can do to mitigate any bias at the advertising stage in terms of the language used. So we're going to look at inclusive language in our job adverts and recruitment materials. And then finally, we're going to look at um, some internal processes um, during your recruitment, not only in terms of attracting new recruits, but also thinking about how you progress and develop women already working in your company. So that's what we're going to cover today. I've only got an hour today, and um, so I'm going to try to get through it as much as possible. So if we're going to talk about inclusive recruitment, I think it's quite important to um, establish what inclusive recruitment means. So inclusive recruitment is the process of attracting applicants, interviewing applicants, and then hiring a diverse set of individuals, but through understanding and valuing different backgrounds and opinions. It's really important that inclusive recruitment should be intersectional and it shouldn't just consider gender, 
but it should also consider race, disability, people with neurodivergent conditions, uh, sexuality, but then also economic and social background as well. Essentially, inclusive recruitment is creating a process that ensures that everybody with the skills for the role can be comfortable applying and progressing through the recruitment process, knowing they have a fair chance of being successful for the position. Inclusive recruitment means the employer has done everything that they can to mitigate any bar barriers that may prevent a candidate from being unsuccessful due to factors that are irrelevant to whether they can do the job or not. So uh, just to get a little bit of interaction um, from the audience today, in the question function, I want you to take a little bit of a think about recruitment practices and what sort of things do you think might get in the way of inclusive recruitment? So I'm just going to give you a couple of moments to have a think and then put that into the question function and then Kirsty's going to moderate that for me. We've got bias and assumptions, and we've got personal opinions and bias. Excellent. It's really great to hear that you've identified bias because unconscious bias can play a role in all stages of the recruitment process. And unconscious bias is um, an automated thought or belief that we have about a thing, a person, or a group of people. Um, and this can really influence decision making in recruitment. But unconscious bias can play a role in all stages of the recruitment process, even before you start the recruitment process. And that can be from the way that you word your job advertisements to where it is that you post them and um, to also all the way through to shortlisting and interview process. It can also come into play for the people that see the job adverts. So things like gender stereotypes, we spoke about this in the last um, session, but sometimes um, STEM isn't, or science, technology, engineering and the built environment isn't necessarily seen as a place for women to be. Um, so unconscious bias works from the employer's perspective, but then also from the applicant's perspective as well. So what this means then is that we have to take some extra steps to encourage underrepresented groups to consider jobs and careers in construction, for example. And these are called positive action measures, and these can be used to encourage participation of underrepresented groups. So we're going to talk about that moving forward. So I just want to ask the audience here today, um, do you feel confident pursuing positive action measures in your company? I think Paul's just going to come up. So you can answer yes, no, or I'm not sure. And Kirsty, would you be able to um, let me know what the results are of the poll? Yeah, we have 75% saying yes, and we have 25% saying uh, I'm not sure. Okay, great. That's really great to hear. I'm going to go through what positive action is um, and address any concerns around that. So, in April 2011, the new positive action provisions on recruitment and promotion was contained in the 2010 Equality Act, and that came into force. So, positive action has been around for around 10 years now. And positive action is one way of trying to counteract deep rooted and historic disadvantage by providing underrepresented groups or disadvantaged groups with help to ensure that they have the same chances as other groups. So the definition of positive action is when an organization voluntarily takes steps to help or encourage certain groups of people who have different needs or who, who are disadvantaged in some way, access work or training. 
This can be used to address the underrepresentation of a group with protected characteristics, such as women. Um, just for the attendees today, the protected characteristics under the 2010 Equality Act are age, disability, gender reassignment, race, religion, sex and sexual orientation, marriage and civil partnership, pregnancy and maternity. So just so you know uh, what pro the protected characteristics are when we talk about them. Positive discrimination means treating one person more favourably than another based upon their protected characteristics. Um, and that is against the law. You're not able to do that. But before we go on to do how do you differentiate between positive action and positive discrimination, I'm just going to um, cover some common concerns that we often get around pursuing positive action. There's some positive, there's some confusion around how it differs from positive discrimination. So what I want to make absolutely clear is that we are not suggesting that you use positive discrimination in a gender context at all. It is against the law. Positive discrimination is only legal when it comes to hiring disabled people. So in society, we tend to agree that disabled people are so disadvantaged that favorable treatment that has been considered is appropriate for employers to take. But on this slide, we can see some other concerns. Um, so, but many women in STEM seem to manage. And yeah, some women really do do well in STEM um, and that really should be celebrated. But it's important to say that women are not a homogenous group. We don't, we're not all exactly the same. And last week we spoke a lot about the leaky pipeline and I talked about how 70% of women drop out of science, technology, engineering and the built environment. So from that perspective, we can see that there are lots of women that aren't actually doing fine um, when it comes to um, working and progressing in STEM. So positive action may be needed to retain women. Positive action may be needed um, and employed at different stages of the pipeline. So you can offer positive action at the recruitment process, but you can also offer positive action um, while women are in work as well. So you can see uh, the difference in the explanation around positive action is that positive action isn't about an individual um, it's about groups of people who experience disadvantage in some way and there's a real wealth of academic evidence showing that women are less likely to be hired promoted and mentored so Yale research called Jennifer versus John which I encourage you to look up found that women candidates were less favoured in the recruitment process. So Yale carried out um, a piece of research where they had um, two applica applicants. One was called John and one was called Jennifer, and they had exactly the same CVs and applications. But what they found was that John was more likely to be hired and was even given a higher starting salary than Jennifer. And this was by both men and women who were recruiting, they made these decisions. And another study by Oxford University and the Nuffield Trust, they showed that applicants with foreign sounding names were significantly less likely to be hired than for those with British sounding names, despite having the exact same CV and qualifications. People from black and ethnic minority backgrounds had to send 80% more applications before they received a positive response than um, those with white sounding names. And the study found employment discrimination against black and those from ethnic minorities is largely unchanged since the 1960s. So a positive action might be a really useful tool to help address um, the barriers experienced by groups of people. Positive action is about recognizing that treating everyone the same doesn't necessarily lead to equity. Some people are starting from different points as illustrated in this um, image here, and they may face additional barriers and therefore need something extra to put in place um, to help them overcome these barriers. But it's really helpful to highlight the distinction between positive action and positive discrimination. 
So positive action um, is an activity that can be designed to encourage more women to apply into construction, for example, but it doesn't favour them over male applicants. Therefore, it happens right before recruitment, not during recruitment. So to give an example, you can encourage female applicants by providing opportunities for women to visit a construction site, for example, or a construction employer um, through an open day or site visit or placement program. But you couldn't use positive action to advertise jobs saying that if you're a woman, you're guaranteed an interview and um, because that would be classed as positive discrimination and therefore that would be unlawful. So another example might be having a placement program for women undergraduates studying um, a construction related course or a degree program to encourage them to consider you as an employer of choice. You can offer them the experience, but what you can't do is then offer them a role at the end of the placement, for example. So we have some examples of positive action activities here. Um, the City of Glasgow College introduced a woman into engineering HNC and they also introduced a similar woman into construction programme as well that has um, been really successful and has seen women um, participating at much higher rates than before. So this was in recognition that one of the barriers to pursuing an engineering course might be the thought of being the only woman on the course and feeling a bit isolated. Women have a choice. They can choose to participate on the women only course or they can go into the mainstream course. And this doesn't disadvantage um, men who want, to, who want to access the course because they can go straight into the mainstream course. Another example is women networks. The example given here is the IET network. Um, these networks can provide sources for support and development for women um, in engineering, but I'm sure there are similar networks in construction as well. And, and they may be a place that women can go to, especially if they're the only woman in their organization or in their team, or they have experienced isolation, unconscious bias, and sometimes conscious bias. Um, so they're unable or have experienced barriers to progressing within their company. They have some support network there. Equate Scotland has a career enhancement program. Um, it's free to access. And this supports women to identify their strengths and achievements and um, so they can develop leadership skills and plan for their future career. So if you know anybody who would um, benefit from this course, uh, please direct them to us. And then finally, um, I run the Equate Career Hub and it's a recruitment portal for employers who want to encourage um, more applications from women across science, technology, engineering um, and the built environment. And this is a positive action measure employers can take to try and widen the network um, of people that they are reaching. So when you're pursuing positive action, it's really important to evidence and evaluate the activities that you're taking. And it's also really important to be able to convince other people of the need for positive action um, by using data, evidence and research. So if you evidence what it is that you're doing, you'll be confident in what you're doing. You'll be able to support the organization to be legally robust when they're pursuing positive action. Um, and you're ensuring you're taking measures which will have the impact that you want because you're evaluating it. So Dr. Chantal Davies is the queen of positive action in the academic world um, in the United Kingdom. And she says that um, it's really important that you gather evidence on the following things. You need to understand if there's a particular underrepresented group in your organization or in your industry and what is the evidence of that underrepresented group. So in construction, we know that women make up only around 15% of um, those in construction. So that's the evidence that there's an underrepresentation there. Then you need to identify what may be the cause of that underrepresentation. How will the measures that you are putting in place address this underrepresentation or aim to tackle it in some way, shape, or form? And then determine if there are any other disadvantage, any other groups that may be disadvantaged by this. And if there are, are there plans to alleviate any of these negative impacts? Or is there another 
something else that you can take or pursue to um, to address the issue without negatively affecting another group. And then finally, you need to establish what period of time this measure is going to be in place for and how are you going to review and evaluate the success of the positive action measure. So before we move on, it's really important to say that um, po positive action can be a really useful tool to try and bring in um, and address under underrepresentation in your organisation. But it needs to be part of a much wider strategy for diversity and inclusion. And we touched on that last week on um, creating inclusive workplace cultures. It requires leadership and commitment from a holistic whole organisation approach. So you might, we're gonna talk about this, but you might also, as well as pursuing positive action, you want to be looking at reviewing the language on your job adverts and where you're advertising your roles. A wider strategy should also include training and development to support change across your whole organisation, not just for your senior leadership team, but also everybody involved in your organisation. And it should also consider the career journey of somebody. After all, it's not just about how you recruit from a diverse talent pool, but also how you retain, develop and progress the talent that you have. So reflecting back on what we talked about, inclusive workplace cultures. So just to summarise, there are loads of good reasons to undertake positive action measures. So as well as potentially increasing ap applicants from underrepresented groups, you're widening the talent pool from which you can choose. Um, diversity is good for business in terms of innovation um, and resilience, particularly in times of, of crisis like we find ourselves in now. Um, and also just to point out that increasingly people are looking at a company's diversity credentials before considering whether they would apply to them. So pursuing positive action measures can help you be seen to be an employer of choice um, for women in construction. So I'm just going to pause here for a second. And before we move on to the next section, I'm just going to ask if anybody has any questions at this point. No, nothing's coming through just now, Aileen. That's fine. I'll move on to the next stage. So we're going to move on and look more in detail about what an inclusive recruitment process looks like. And I'm going to start thinking about job adverts and job recruitment materials. And I'm going to talk about the importance of language. And I'm introducing the concept of a gendered language. But just before we do, I'm just going to cover a couple of things. So I'm going to be talking about gendered language in binary terms. So when I what I what I mean when I say that is I mean I'm going to be talking about it in terms of male and female. But this is the assumption that those born biologically, um, male or female, will have the appearance, character traits, and behaviours associated with that gender. So either being um, a man or a woman. But we recognise that gender is a social construct that imposes roles and expectations on a person based upon their biological sex. And it is now widely accepted that men and women are not homogenous groups who don't carry um, these traits and um, conforming to these really narrow socially prescriptive gender roles. So it's actually quite important that we talk about language um, and, how, and how they carry these um, stereotypes. While we think the language that the language that we use is neutral, many words carry a lot of gendered connotations that reinforce gender stereotypes that currently exist in our society today. So some of these are very obvious, for example, um, mum and dad. Mum is female, dad is male, um, but some are much more subtle. So being aware of subtle gender bias and language um, can actually help us create a more inclusive culture. Um, but also workplace cultures, and then also look at our job adverts and um, how it creates a more inclusive recruitment process. So here are a few everyday words, and I want you to think, do any of these words have any gendered connotations for you? So if you have any thoughts on this, please write them in the question function. Sorry, it says the chat function there, but please write them in the question function. And let me know if you think that 
any of these words are, con um, are associated with either being male or being female. We've got um, cat, female, dog, male, um, a car being male, Prosecco being female and cupcake being female. Yeah, excellent. Is there any other thoughts or reflections coming through? Most people are saying the same, um, kind of all agreeing with, the, with, those, with those ones. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kirsty. Um, so yeah, you are all right. It's actually quite um, clear, well, clear in our language to see that cat is associated with, with being female and um, because we use terms like the crazy cat lady, but it's actually interesting to say to see that crazy like cat and re um, referring it to being a woman um, or associating it with being female is never said in a particularly positive way. Whereas dog, you can use the term one man and his dog or dog is a man's best friend um, and it's seen as a really positive thing. Um, cars have, long, have a long time been associated with being um, masculine and being interested in cars um, and Prosecco is often seen as when women come together to um, socialise they drink Prosecco whereas men come together they drink beer um, and then cupcake is seen as um, sweet, it is fluffy um, and it is associated with being um, feminine rather than being masculine. So hopefully you can see how powerful this gender bias can be and it's actually somewhat ridiculous that a cupcake is seen as a female thing because I'm pretty sure when it comes down to it men are just as likely to enjoy a cupcake as a woman, same with Prosecco and women are just as likely to enjoy cars um, than men are. So that was me just introducing the um, gendered language to you. But if we refer it back to um, our job descriptions and our job materials, I've got a question for you. So which of these words listed below do you think regularly featured in STEM, so that's science, technology, engineering and maths related job adverts? And a poll should come up. So answers that we have um, are we've got 40% aggressive, 20% uh, dominant, 20% assertive and 20% have said uh, decisive with 0% saying boasting. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kirsty. So uh, would it surprise you if I said they all appeared and they appeared a lot? So aggressive, which most of you said um, appeared, you thought had appeared regularly, um, appeared over 9,000 times in job adverts. And this is us um, analysing um, technology related job adverts. Dominant was around 1,000, assertive was around 3,000, boasting, which nobody um, chose, was around 4,500, decisive, was around uh, 3,000 and Ninja um, came up 347 times. So I'm just going to ask you to think about, well, first of all, what do you think of this? And then also, who do you think identifies with these types of characteristics? If you'd like to put your thoughts in the question function, um, that would be great. I think people are a wee bit unsure, Aileen, so it'd be great if you could maybe talk us through it. Yeah, no, that's okay. So if we look um, 
at what Google thinks. So if we put into Google Images and we write aggressive, this is what comes up. If we write dominant, these are the images that come up. And if we write ninja, these are the images that come up. So clearly these characteristics are considered to be largely associated with the male gender and what it means to be a man. If this type of language and these required qualities are predominant in job advertisements, do you think women will see themselves in these jobs or do you see them, or would they see them as being for somebody else? So as you can see, language really does matter. And often when we write job descriptions across science, technology, engineering, and the built environment, particularly in construction actually, um, they are very task and they are very skills focused and they can be quite heavy in technical language. So while this may be required to an, an extent, um, overuse of such language can be off-putting, um, particularly for early career women and people who may be transitioning into the construction industry from another sector. So what I'm trying to highlight here is that although you think of your recruitment material as neutral or as unbiased, you'll find that many are inadvertently aimed at men. But the good news is, is that with a little bit of work, you can make your materials, um, so from job adverts all the way through to aptitude tests, accessible to all genders. Um, and this is something I can help you with at Equate Scotland and um, through our job advert review service. But um, I'm going to talk you through some of, the, some of the things that you need to be looking out for. So, Academic research by the University of Waterloo and Duke defined a series of words which were socially, culturally and historically carry stereotypical weight towards a particular gender. So that's where um, masculine language and feminine language comes from. So I'm going to give you a minute just to read over these um, and you can consider whether these words are used in your job descriptions or in your marketing materials ever. Um, where there is an asterisk that indicates that this represents different formations so for example aggressive also represents aggression committed commitment etc so i'm just going to give you a moment to read over these So hopefully that has given you enough time to just read through those really quickly. So using this research and those um, words that I have just shown you, Total Jobs applied this to an analysis of over 75,000 job ads in the UK to assess for gender bias in their language. Total Jobs is a recruitment website. It showed, their research showed that male coded words were most commonly used in male dominated industries, including science, marketing and sales. Whereas female biased adverts were most commonly found within education, within customer service and within catering. This isn't surprising given the gendered segregation of where men and women work. But it does demonstrate that the words that we use can reinforce stereotypes and send messages about what jobs are meant for who and who should be included in which sectors. So 
So gendered wording in job adverts do affect the recruitment processes. Emphasis on masculine traits and technical skills can make women believe that they will not be a right fit for the role. Of course, it's important to say that women are analytic, they are competitive and they are confident, but they are less likely to view themselves in these terms than men, given what has been shown in the research, and therefore they are then less likely to apply for the role. So if you have gendered masculine, a lot of masculine coded language in your job advert, and um, then you could be inadvertently putting women off applying for your jobs. Research by Hewlett Packard highlighted that women are unlikely to apply for a job unless they meet all of the requirements on the job description. Men are likely to apply for a job if they meet around 60% of the requirements on the job description. So this is also something that you should really bear in mind when you're writing your job adverts. So as not to inadvertently remove women for the recruitment process through their own self deselection. You want to be able to um, deselect people from the recruitment process. You don't want people deselecting themselves before you even see if they're good for, um, they have the right skills and, and qualities for the role. So a good case study around gendered language <clears throat> is the Open University. So they commissioned a series of inclusive recruitment training uh, for staff from Equate Scotland. <clears throat> and what they particularly valued were the tools and the practical application um, that they were provided. And what they did is they applied the learning to their prospectus and their course descriptions, as well as their marketing materials and the website. And as a result of this, they noticed a considerable increase um, in their campaign performance, which you can see in the next slide. So you can see from these figures that they experienced significant increases in the way people engage with their recruitment campaigns. Women in STEM engagement was up by 45% and men in psychology engagement was up by 48%. And those were the two areas where they were trying to address the gender imbalance on their courses. So they wanted to see more women in science, technology, technology engineering and the built environment related to courses. And they wanted to see more men interested in the psychology related courses. But it's important to say that it's not just about um, the words that you use. Tone and structure of your job description is really important. So when someone speaks, their tone indicates their attitude. And this is exactly the same for a document, a piece of writing, um, or a job description where an organization's voice is speaking uh, to potential applicants. So when you're writing your job des description, consider what exactly the job description says in regards to language, but then consider who the job description is speaking to and how it is portrayed. So for tone, you might want to think about how you would describe your company culture. Do you foster a culture of learning and look for people to grow within your company? Um, are you a small organisation and you have a family-like or community working environment? Is your organisation committed to a particular cause? Make sure you draw all these out in your job description to sell um, your organisation to candidates. Or consider, does the tone of your job description indicate that the company is looking for an employee and they can get as much out of the employee, but it doesn't really offer what the um, employer can give to the employee? That can be something that job descriptions um, tend to miss out is the benefits of working for the organization. Also think about the specific role. So think about what it is that you're asking for. Are, when you're writing your job description, are you looking for a wish list of skills and experience that you know you're never gonna get um, from one individual? So remember that we said that men and women differ when they apply and they won't apply if they don't meet all of the criteria. So making sure um, that you have only what is required to start the role um, and it isn't sort of a wish list of things that you would like from somebody. Also does the language and the skills listed speak to a particular type or group of people and um, consider where unconscious bias might be coming into play and use that research um, from, from uh, Waterloo and Duke to assess that. 
And finally, a survey from Scotland, from a survey in Scotland by Purpose HR found that women are most attracted to jobs where career progression is clear and there isn't an extensive list of experience. So there are a number of things to consider when putting together a job advert. And I'm going to take you through some of these now. Um, but you will also get a PDF version of this um, and it will help you shape your job adverts going forward in the future. So we've just spoken about criteria, but think about the criteria. Make some skills and experience desirable if they're not absolutely essential um, to start the role. Highlight the social impact of the work that you do. Make this really visible. Women are often attracted to companies and roles that help people and communities. So if you can showcase this on your uh, job recruitment materials, um, that will widen your recruitment pool. Skills and attributes highlight just as the soft skills, just as much as, or the interpersonal skills, just as much as the technical skills. So things like teamwork, communication, creativity and problem solving are absolutely essential skills for working in the construction industry but they tend to be um, not included in job descriptions so be really explicit about these types of skills because women often identify with these as well as technical skills support women can feel isolated in environments that are predominantly male so highlight any support that is on offer for example if you have a mentoring program or you organize any organization is connected to a women's network this can help demonstrate how you support a culture of equality and inclusion that we spoke about in the last session and also demonstrates that you use positive action case studies seeing women in stem and construction roles reinforces the message that the job is for women too so what you can do is you can include case studies of women who are um, thriving in your organization and also include these on the website as well. And again, word choice. Think about the language that you're using. Review the words that you're using. Um, at the end of the session, you will receive a link to a gender decoder that will help you to identify gendered language in your job description. Please note that um, this is a starting point and language is really nuanced, um, so it won't pick up all gendered language, but it is a really good place to start if you haven't before. So I'm just going to pause there before I carry on and ask if there are any questions at this stage. No, I think you're good to continue, Aileen. I've got 50 minutes left, so I should get through it all. So, um, Assessing the language and the tone is just one way to, to widen um, the recruitment pool. Um, I've talked a lot about this, but just to fire this home, only include the essential criteria. Reduce as much technical jargon as you possibly can. Somebody who isn't um, aware of your industry should be able to understand the purpose of the role when, uh, um, when looking at your job description. Avoid using the term competitive salary. While the construction industry isn't known for its transparency in pay and reward, letting candidates know a salary or salary range can help them assess whether a role is for them. And it can also help address um, unequal pay and then also the gender pay gap. So also avoid asking current salary or salary expectations. So currently the gender pay gap in construction is around 20% and it goes up to 40% in some companies. Um, where the national average is around 12%. So while there's a few factors involved here, if you base a salary on someone's previous salary, women may, women may be financially disadvantaged throughout their entire career because it is based upon what they have earned before and there may be a chance that they are, were not paid equally. There's also a myth that women don't ask for pay rises. And they do. But while men do ask for pay rises probably more often than women, when women do ask, they are much less likely to receive it than men. So just to bear that in mind. Also, 
does your advert reflect um, your culture, your ethos or your mission? Um, people are looking for organisations where they um, align with the um, organisational values. To demonstrate that you foster a culture of diversity um, and inclusion, include a diversity statement on your job advert. And then a happy to talk flexible working logo. Um, flexible working is currently only advertised on 11% of job adverts, whereas we know especially now that it is a requirement for many people both men and women and you may be losing really valuable talent if you do not include this on your job description so if you have a flexible working policy or um please include this on your job description um i've talked a little bit about um the gender the gender pay gap and um, total jobs recently launched some research about how men and women differ in their behavior and expectations at different points in the recruitment process around salary negotiations this is really nicely presented so um, i want you to have a look at this um, and you can have a look at the end there is a link that's going to be going out at the end by um, csic so i would encourage you to do that other recommendations are if you don't have a diverse candidate pool and if your budget and your timelines allow it, extend the application closing date and then consider where it is that you're advertising your roles. Promote them within women's networks, for example, Equate Scotland, um, or if there's women networks in your industry. Um, also consider using um, other forms of social media, such as um, Facebook, um, and that can help you reach a wider, wider group of people. Also, encourage women to apply for your roles and promotions internally. Find out what support they might need to build confidence or their skills to successfully apply for the role. So at Equate Scotland, we provide career clinics. I've mentioned the uh, career enhancement programme, and we have annual CPD programmes that which are free to access and can support career planning and confidence building to enable women to move into that, move into the next stage of their career. Um, so if you want to see women progressing in your organisation, encourage them and support them to do that. Good practice, adopting good practice within your internal processes is really important if you want to see um, an increase in women or other groups into your organisation. So measure the diversity in your recruitment process, monitor who's applying for the jobs and who's being successful, but crucially, monitor who is missing from the recruitment process. This can help you make a case for positive action activities like we discussed earlier in the session. To mitigate the impact of bias, um, similar to the Jennifer and John, John example, um, or the Oxford University example around names, remove as much identifying information before the shortlisting process as possible. Often this means just removing the front page um, or asking for anonymous CVs and assigning each application a number. But please note this doesn't mitigate all of the bias that is involved in the shortlisting and recruitment process. This is just the first step. Um, gender balanced recruitment panels can also help to mitigate bias as they can provide a variety of perspectives and that means unconscious bias is cha um, challenged. But ensure that everyone on the panel is trained in your recruitment process and can consider training around recognizing and mitigating and mitigating bias as an interviewer. And finally, organizations might have different recruitment styles, but competency-based questions tend to reduce bias in the interview process. So if your interview is focusing on the skills and experience required to do the role rather than other factors that can come into play, such as likability or um, internal connections that they may have, and um, can help address or mitigate any bias in the recruitment process. If you accompany this with a scoring matrix, um, this can help you ensure that you're objectively comparing performance question by question, rather than the overall performance of each candidate. And when you're providing feedback to a candidate or you're assessing whether a candidate um, is going to be successful, avoid saying that someone is just not the right fit. And question this further. Are you focusing on them as their personality or um, other unconscious bias that may come into play? 
um, or are you basing them upon their skills and their experience as demonstrated in their interview? And then before I just hand over, I just want to say a little thing about um, using artificial intelligence tools in recruitment. So they're becoming more and more common for organisations to use AI to help with the recruitment process. But it's not yet at the point of being able to accurately assess both applicants or job descriptions because algorithms have been found to reinforce human bias um, in, in the recruitment process. So it's just to be wary of that. Language tools tend to pick up the obvious language, um, but language is deeper and it's very nuanced. Um, so it might not pick up absolutely everything. So it's just to be aware of that. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, and if you would like to get more involved in the work that Equate Scotland do, whether that's to support you as an employer or to support women in your organisation, um, please get in touch and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Great, thanks Aileen. I've got a few questions here. So can you provide an example of positive action in the workplace? Yeah, so um, support groups are really um, as, as a really good positive action measure. So if you have um, a women's support group or you have family support groups as well, so it may be that during COVID-19 that you might want to create a group within your organisation that um, helps families and parents support one another. Um, that's a good um, starting point. Um, using Equate Scotland on our career enhancement programmes, if, you, um, if you're looking specific for specific skills within your workforce to allow them to progress, you might want to think about um, identifying a group of people that may benefit from that and doing that to help them to progress in their career. So that's a really good example of that as well. And we can provide, we can, if you can't, if you don't feel comfortable doing that within your organisation, Equate Scotland can help you do that. Great. Um, and I've got another question here. Um, how do we ensure diversity at every level of the industry um, so everyone is aware of it and contributing to it? Yeah, so I spoke about this a lot in the session last week, and it's about creating um, a culture that every single person is responsible for. So we need to have, um, it needs to be directed from the top. So senior leaders need to take this seriously, and it needs to be ingrained into company and industry culture. So um, training around why it's really important is often um, targeted at sort of senior senior leadership level, but it needs to be all the way through the industry, every single person to be um, involved in that. And people need to feel confident to be able to call out or address anything that is either discriminatory or is even also like nuanced or microaggressions that people may experience in the workplace. They need to be able to feel that they can either call it out if it happens to them and it gets taken every taken seriously or if they see it happen to someone else be able confident enough to be able to um, address that without any negative um, without a negative response from the organization that you work in yeah, it's a huge great. relationship <laughs> um, and last question I've got here is does uh, the recommendations around recruitment process that you've been speaking about today work for small micro businesses as well as kind of large organizations and is there different kind of steps that a micro business should maybe take to a large organization so i would say the steps or the recommendations that i've made are all a part of good recruitment practice regardless of the size of your organization so if you're at a stage whether you are a micro business and you embed good recruitment process at the very beginning as your organization grows um, you won't have to go back and reassess um, and redesign your recruitment process. So I would say, yes, you can use these um, recommendations from the very beginning. Um, and as your company grows, it, it, you're more likely to recruit and retain um, a diverse workforce. Great. Great. Um, and, oh, I think I've got maybe one more coming in. Um, 
what should you do if you come across a uh, discrimination in your opinion in my opinion so it depends on the organization's policies and processes and i'm not actually in a position to provide people with advice on um how they should do that but if the person wants to um, get in touch with the Kuwait Scotland separately, I'd be happy to address that. Amazing. Thanks, Amazing. Aileen. Um, and I think we've got uh, one last poll to come now. So it'd be great if everyone could just um, give us your thoughts on this, this last poll. As I said at the start, this we've got a twelve uh, a twelve month program, so it's really good for us to know um, what you would like to hear more about and where we can where we can support. Um, perfect. So I see more supporting in. 100% have said supporting a multi-generational workforce. Um, I, I mean, I guess, I guess it's a good split and people would like to know a wee bit about everything. So that's great. And we will make sure that we can uh, tackle all those topics um, as we go throughout the year. Aileen, do you have anything to add before we close? No, thank you so much for joining today. Great. So I'd just like to say uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, today we hope you got a lot out of this session and can take it back to your organisations. Thank you to Aileen for taking this session and Danielle who is behind the scenes making sure everything is running smoothly. Uh, we have our second session um, that we will we'll share, our next session that we have uh, we will share after this uh, webinar with you so that you can continue your uh, diversity and inclusion journey. Um, so that's just left for me to say enjoy the rest of your day. Um, thanks and bye.